The Wellness Hour. An in-depth discussion with today's top physicians and medical leaders. And now, your host, Randy Alvarez. You're watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Alvarez. Today's topic, new breakthroughs in the treatment of AFib. With us, we have an expert on the topic, triple board certified Dr. Sani. Dr. Sani, welcome to the program. Great. Thanks, Randy. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get into uh, today's topic, we should also mention that board certified in internal medicine, yep. cardiology, mm -hmm. and electrophysiology. Yes. And what is, by the way, I mean, what defines an electrophysiologist? So an electrophysiologist, Randy, is a physician who is a cardiologist but they've done extra training and have a separate board certification in arrhythmia management. Okay, so w when you hear the term like a rhythm specialist, yep. that's what you do. Then you're a uh, professor at UCSD, Yes. part of a, I guess a large group sure. of cardiologists there. What's your role? Well, so I'm an assistant professor with the University of California, San Diego. Okay. Uh, my role there is to take care of patients who have heart rhythm disorders. That's my primary role with the university. We are a training institution, so I help teach fellows who are cardiologists and electrophysiologists in training to go out and practice in the community and take care of patients. And we're an academic medical center, so I spend a fair bit of my time also doing research to help advance the treatment of various heart rhythm disorders. So you're also so you're working with a young cardiologist? Correct. And what, I mean, do you have a specialty that you're focusing on in cardiology with these guys? Yeah, so I'm an electrophysiologist, so we deal predominantly with heart rhythm problems, and so it's a separate fellowship after you've trained in cardiology. So the fellows I work with are already cardiologists, and they're training for arrhythmic management. So you do uh, procedures about uh, four, four days a week? Yes. Yes, I do procedures about four days a week. I'm doing all types of procedures for heart rhythm problems, whether it's putting in pacemakers or doing catheter-based ablation procedures. Uh, the other times when I'm not doing procedures, I'm either seeing patients in the clinic, in the office, or focusing in on research, particularly for atrial fibrillation. Okay, so with AFib, how big of yeah. a problem is it, by the way? AFib is a huge problem, Randy. It's a very prevalent disease. It affects about 1% of the population of the United States, which is currently about 2.5 million people in the U.S. who have atrial fibrillation. Um, and those are the ones that are diagnosed? Those are the ones that What's are diagnosed. What's your hunch on people that have it that aren't diagnosed? It's, it's a good question. I think a, a Millions fair, more? At least, okay. yes, okay. for sure. So what defines AFib? What are the symptoms, I should say? Yeah, well, you know, atrial fibrillation is an irregular heart rhythm, uh, where basically the top of the heart, the atria, starts to fibrillate and be completely out of control. Um, the symptoms are quite varied. There's a whole spectrum of symptoms. There are patients who have no symptoms whatsoever and they will be seen in their doctor's office and you'll listen to their heart and it's beating completely irregularly and you'll get an EKG and you'll go, gosh, you're an AFib, when did this start? And, and they'll have no idea. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, there's people who, their hearts will start racing in this atrial fibrillation completely randomly for no reason at all. They can't predict when it's gonna happen and then all of a sudden, their heart just starts racing. They feel it palpating, they get anxious, they get nervous. Sometimes they get lightheaded or dizzy. They can get chest pain, shortness of breath. People can have a lot of fatigue, um, just disabled when they're in the atrial fibrillation. I've had several patients who, because of the frequency with which it happens and the symptoms they have when it happens, really just can't function. They so stop working. So who does the diagnosis, by the way? Okay, so somebody's yeah. watching this, they have a racing heart. Yeah. But is it okay? Is it normal though to have a racing heart? Like you know, once in a while, once a month. Well, that's the thing. A month? Sometimes if you're yes. Anxious. Or? Sure. So sometimes you can, depending on the situation. So if you're running up a flight of stairs, your heart rate's going to speed up. If you get nervous or anxious or are in pain, that can speed up. Um, but that's usually a normal heart rhythm where it'll speed up, and you'll see it speed up in what we call a sinus rhythm, where it speeds up predictably and slows down predictably. With AFib, it'll just start racing out of the blue, really for no reason whatsoever, but that is a tr problem with sometimes making the diagnosis because sometimes people will tell their, heart, their doctor, oh, well, my heart started racing and I felt really nervous and anxious, and the doctor will think, well, maybe they're having a panic attack or an anxiety attack, and they won't look for the problem that's actually an arrhythmia causing those symptoms rather than the nervous causing, nervousness causing the heart rate to speed up. So people normally go to their primary care physician with this racing heart problem. Correct. And maybe it is uh, not taken seriously enough by the primary care physician possibly? Yeah, well I think what can happen, especially in some of the younger patients, is they'll tell their physician, you know, my heart was racing, I was really nervous and anxious, and the doctor will get an EKG in the office and say, well it looks pretty normal. Because and they so, weren't having an because episode Because they right weren't now. having it at that time. All right. And all then right. sometimes, sometimes they'll take it a step further and they'll order a heart monitor at home to see, well, maybe I missed something in the office, because an EKG is only six seconds. 
So it's maybe I missed something in the right? office. Right. So so they'll get a heart monitor, maybe a Holter monitor. Um, it's the most common heart monitor. So like a 24-hour monitor? Yeah, it's like a 24-hour heart monitor that people will wear at home, and they'll look for any arrhythmias on that. So is that the answer then? Well, so that's the problem. The problem is, is the symptoms could be quite intermittent. So they may be getting symptoms once a week, twice a week, three times a month. So if in any 24-hour period of time, you may not see anything. And it doesn't mean that it's normal. It just means that you so missed it. So it's not it. enough, the 24-hour? In a lot of cases, it's not enough. So what, 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 what's uh, the next level? Yeah, so there's different monitoring options. What I use a fair bit of are mobile outpatient telemetry monitors. Okay. And there are heart monitors that you can wear. Instead of for 24 hours, you can wear them for 20, 30 days. So if you're getting symptoms once or twice a month or once or twice a week, over that period of time, you're going to see something. Whereas if you wear a monitor for just 24 hours, you, you may miss it. Interesting, interesting. Now, uh, I mean, is this what patients should ask their doctors? For? I think so. I think I mean, the, to, I mean to I, take it yeah, seriously. Absolutely. I think, you know, not, doctors often do what they're familiar with or what they're comfortable with, but there are times where a 24 hour monitor, even though that's what you're used to ordering, may not be the right answer. So you have to gauge it by how often the patient's having symptoms. If they're having symptoms daily, then sure, a 24 hour monitor is all you need. But if need. it's once a week, though. But if it's once a week, then you need to monitor for at least that period of time or ideally a little longer. Do you think it's just a matter of patient compliance? They don't want that 20 day or 30 day No, I don't think monitor. so. I don't think so. Because most patients, when I explain to them what I'm ordering, why, what we're looking for, compliance is rarely an issue. It's not yeah. an issue at all. So what, what about the patient that does nothing? Maybe they, they have a racing heart. Maybe they, they got that 24-hour monitor. Yeah. It didn't happen during that 24 hours. Right. What, what, what does the primary care physician usually do? Well, I mean. Well, they treat them with blood thinners? What do they do? Well, if it's not diagnosed, they're not going to receive any treatment. And so I think that that's the key is it has to be diagnosed because everybody needs some treatment for their atrial fibrillation whether that treatment is controlling the heart rate, whether it's controlling the heart rhythm, or whether it's being on blood thinners to try to prevent the risk of stroke, pretty much everybody needs some type of treatment. So if it's not picked up by the primary care physician, it obviously won't be treated until it is diagnosed. And we talked on the phone, and I said, well, you know, if you had to say something yeah. frustrates you, what is it? And, and I'll paraphrase, but I think you said, it's not being treated aggressively enough. Well, Elaborate I, on that. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, what happens is when you go into the doctor's office and the symptoms are intermittent and you come in and you get an EKG and it's normal, then there's not a diagnosis, so then there's no rush to pr provide any therapy. Okay, um, and then what can happen is AFib, as it has these intermittent episodes that come and go, they can progress and start coming more and more frequently to the point where you can go into the AFib all the time. So if you go six months between your doctor's visit, and then the next time you're seeing your doctor, and then they'll get the EKG, and then you're in AFib because you went into it and you're seeing it all the time. And that's when people tend to get referred to the heart rhythm doctor because they see it and they go, oh, look at this EKG, you're in AFib, you better see the heart can rhythm doctor. Can that be too late in some cases well, for the best treatment options? It can be, it can be. I think it's better to detect the AFib earlier and ideally be referred to a heart rhythm specialist earlier because there's more treatment options before it progresses into a more persistent or permanent state. Okay, and let's move on to ablation for a moment. Sure. Uh, I guess after they've tried medication therapy yeah. first. Correct. But they're still having these problems. Right. Racing heart, I'm calling it racing heart. And uh, tell me about ablation. What does it do? What are the results? Sure. So cardiac catheter-based ablation is recommended for patients who have symptoms from their AFib, who have tried medical therapy, and it hasn't been completely successful. Even the best medical therapies are only successful about 50 to 65% of the time. So a lot of people... Medical therapies meaning medications? Correct. And what yeah. are they on, by the way? I mean, what... what uh... Well, antiarrhythmic medications, that's another reason to see, in my opinion, a heart rhythm specialist, because antiarrhythmic medications are notoriously difficult to use, and they have to be done with somebody with experience in knowing how to use them, because what they do are they alter the ion channels in the heart that conduct electrical current right, and trigger, trigger the heart into arrhythmias. And so they, you have to use them um, in the correct patients, meaning there's reasons you shouldn't use certain medications in certain patients if they have structural heart disease, they've had heart attacks, or medications that can be pro-arrhythmic or cause other heart rhythm problems. So which antiarrhythmic to pick really depends on the clinical profile of the patient. There's certainly a whole... So don't all cardiologists, though, know this or... Or, or, or do this? Yeah, you know. Or does it have to be a rhythm specialist, in your it, opinion? It doesn't have to be a rhythm specialist, but I think different cardiologists focus on different things and have different comfort levels. There's cardiologists who mainly do coronary interventions and deal with blockages in the heart. There's cardiologists who mainly deal with heart failure. I'm a cardiologist who only deals with heart rhythm problems. So my experience and comfort level with certain antiarrhythmic medications is 
probably higher than the general cardiologist. There are some okay. who certainly have the experience level to do Are there patients it. out there, though, that have these rhythm problems? Yeah. They're on medications, antiarrhythmic, you call it, and uh -huh. that's to keep the, the heart steady. Correct. Right? That have never seen a rhythm specialist? Sure, plenty. And they should, though. I, I think I mean, every, is that how you're, you're feeling? I, I think everybody should see a rhythm specialist at least one time. And who do they ask? They ask their primary care physician? Do they ask the cardiologist treating them? Yeah, either of the above. E e either one. The, the general cardiologist can refer to an arrhythmia specialist, which is often the case. A primary care doctor can refer to an arrhythm specialist if they think the main problem for that patient is an irregular heart rhythm. When I hear that, that, that oftentimes by the time they get to a rhythm specialist, it's too late. What does that mean, it's too late? I mean, to, to have sure. maximum benefit. What, well, what does that mean? As I mentioned, the AFib, when it's what we call paroxysmal, meaning it comes and goes, it can be harder to diagnose. Okay. And at a rate of about 10% a year, it can progress to a more persistent atrial fibrillation where you're in it all the time. And that's usually when they get referred. The problem is, is the, heart, the more atrial fibrillation that the heart sees, your heart remodels to accommodate having what atrial does that mean, fibrillation. Remodels? Well, remodels means it changes to perpetuate the arrhythmia, to let you have more and more of it. So the first changes are molecular. They change at the ion channel level, and the ion channels change the way they conduct minerals or current in the heart so that the refractory periods shorten and the heart starts to fibrillate and stays there. As it stays there, then it structurally changes. You get fibrosis or scarring of the heart, and the heart actually begins to enlarge and create more circuits. Yeah, it creates more circuits that perpetuate the AFib. So sometimes when they come in at that stage, it's harder to get their rhythm under control with medications, so the with ablation, like or anything else. In its, in its beat? Yes, very, it very large. uneven, and it, and, it, and it enlarges, particularly in the left atrium, which is where most AFib comes from. That top left chamber of the heart starts to enlarge over time. And then they, okay, but if you got them early, let's say that, okay, so medication, they still had some racing heart. If you did ablation, that's a procedure you do Correct. a lot of? Yes. How would that benefit them the, from preventing this yeah. enlarged heart, things like that? Well, so the ablation procedure, one, is much more, more effective earlier in the course of the disease. So people have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation where it comes and goes. The results from the ablation are significantly better. Two, after an ablation procedure, the hearts will often get a little bit smaller. And also, the less AFib you have, it's not going to continue to progress to that state where it's gotten larger and more persistent. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, so this ablation procedure, tell me what it is. So catheter ablation procedure is a minimally invasive procedure um, for people who have symptoms from their atrial fibrillation um, and have tried medical therapy that hasn't been effective. All right. What we do is we put some catheters in the, in the femoral area, in the groins in the heart, into the femoral veins and we run these catheters or small plastic tubes from the veins up into the heart. The, the catheters have some metal tips on them and we can evaluate the electrical signals in the heart and look for the signals that are abnormal that shouldn't be there and we apply some electrocautery which is radio frequency is energy. Frequency? It's okay. radio frequency current so it, it cauterizes areas of the heart with, with abnormal electrical signals and essentially forms a scar there so the heart can't trigger into the atrial so fibrillation. So that blocks the connection? Correct, exactly. Okay, it blocks the connections from most notably the pulmonary veins, an area that in the left of the heart where the blood flow. So the heart can't race if it has so a scar tissue So it can't race, there. correct. Interesting. Yes. So that Okay, well, what is the success rate with that? So for people with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, where it comes and goes, the success rates are pretty good. So in Like a year of, out is what? About 85%. About 85% success for people who have already failed medical therapy. Of no more racing heart? Correct. Interesting. I mean, that's got to be better. Does it stack up better than uh, drug therapy? Yeah, these are people who have already failed medical therapy, and after that, the success rate is 85%, and that's ideally without needing any more medical therapy to keep the rhythm under control. But, but now the current indications are you've got to go to uh, medical therapy first, meaning these drugs. Correct. That make people very tired, right? Well, a lot of medications can have side effects. Some are very well tolerated. Some are better tolerated than others. Um, but all medications can have some side effects. Antiarrhythmic medications notoriously are on the worser end of side effects or adverse effects from the medications. But um, an ablation procedure is minimally invasive. Um, it uh, takes a few hours to do. We pull the catheters out when you're done. You're up walking around four to six hours so after the procedure. So you're going inside the heart and causing these scar tissues. Correct. So those electrical impulses can't connect. Correct. Is that, is that right? My understanding Yeah, that's correct? exactly right. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. And then, so why not do it first? If yeah. it's 85% success rate, why yeah. not do it first before the medication? And are there any studies to? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, Randy. It's a great question because um, 
In some patients, it probably is a good idea to do it first. There's some patients who don't want to take the medications or the reasons you shouldn't use them. It's not a proven hypothesis now. So on a case-by-case -case basis, we will occasionally, but I'd say rarely, we'll do an ablation procedure first. Currently, the guidelines recommend a trial of medical therapy. Now, there are studies, as you alluded to, okay. that are evaluating whether or not we should do an ablation as a first line before medical first therapy. First line, okay. Th yeah. That means before medication. That before means medical therapy. Heart, you do right. ablation. Yeah. And there's studies evaluating that right now. Where are these being done? Um, they're being done multinational are you studies. Doing CSD? We are. We are. Okay. There's a Cabana trial. When are very you going to tell me about that study? <laughs> the You're Cabana, saving that for last. Saving okay. that for later. Yeah. No, okay. but a, a large multi multinational study, multi-center study, um, evaluating that question. It's not a proven what's your, hypothesis what's your right personal now. Opinion? You know, I, I stick to the guidelines. I, I, no, I do with the medical I mean, what, studies. I mean, what, are, what are your thoughts? It'd probably be better to do that first. Yeah. Well, I think in some patients who are younger who have normal hearts, who are likely to have a very good result from an ablation. I think in there, there's so a, if, certainly if a population. So if your heart has not, yeah. as you call it, remodeled, hasn't yeah. changed, yeah. but they still have this electrical yeah. I think situation. Yeah, I think they'll do ahead. very well with an ablation procedure. Yes. So you like that. Yes. But especially if somebody's been on these drugs, we're going to take a quick break, but yeah. I want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. If somebody's been on these drugs for six months, a, a year, yeah. and they're still having here and there little electrical storms or whatever you call them, right? these are people that need to see a rhythm specialist. Well, I think that they or should th consider ablation. They, they should discuss their treatment options. Um, for some people, it's the right thing to do. For some people, if your symptoms are very intermittent and they're well tolerated, you don't necessarily need an ablation procedure. But if they're procedure, intermittent, but, though, yeah, then I mean, aren't they can candidates for ablation? I mean, when do you become a candidate for ablation? If you've tried medical therapy and, and you're still and getting it breaks through and you're getting symptoms, you're a, you're a candidate. Like one one every six months, one every three months. I mean, if it's still happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really, you know, it depends on your quality of life, Randy. So there okay. are patients who are very symptomatic in their atrial fibrillation. They're very debilitated by it. If you're one of those people, then I think you probably need more aggressive treatment. If you have very infrequent symptoms and it doesn't bother you too much, I don't think you necessarily need a surgical procedure for that. Okay. But if it's bothering you and there's options, you should at least know what your options are. All right. Okay. So, it's uh, it's being missed, misdiagnosed. Sure. But patients also are self-diagnosing that it's just normal. Yeah. I mean, to have I a racing heart here and there. Right. 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 And, and sometimes it's not. And, and and if it's not, it requires treatment in some respects. Even outside of controlling the arrhythmia, there are problems with atrial fibrillation. It leads to development of heart failure. It leads to stroke at a five times higher rate than people who don't have AFib. And so they may need to be on blood thinners, for example. Even if they don't need an ablation procedure or even if they don't need antiarrhythmic medications, and, and they may need those as well, but, but they may need other treatment. So it should be diagnosed and it should be treated or at least evaluated so for the most appropriate treatment. So if you have a racing treatment. heart, take it seriously. Absolutely. And ask to see all the specialists you can, Definitely. especially a rhythm specialist. Yes. Okay, let me ask you this question. Okay. After they've had the procedure, the the uh, the procedure you do, all of a sudden uh, it's escaping me. The, the Catheter ablation. ablation, right? Okay. Yeah. Do they still have to maintain? Uh, of the eighty-five percent of the people that yeah. this works, yep. Do they still have to stay on blood thinners? Yeah. So initially, after the procedure, all patients should be on blood thinners for at least two months. That's a national recommendation, and that's to prevent any risk of stroke after the procedure. After two months, you take it on a case by case basis. But if you have an overall low risk factor. Uh, low risk factors for development of stroke, we can often stop the blood thinners after two months. So do you have patients that, that are completely off medications? Yes. A year out? Yes. Had a severe AFib problem? Yes. Uh -huh. With ablation? After ablation, yeah. That's good. Now you say this is a lifestyle thing too. I mean this is about, you know, with AFib people can't, probably can't go to work. Well, or can't exercise, yeah. or afraid it. Afraid to exercise. That's actually a very common one, actually. But yes, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of uh, a whole spectrum of symptoms, as as I mentioned. So some patients will have no symptoms at all, but I've had several patients who are completely debilitated to the point where they stopped working, they they lost their jobs, and really? now that their rhythm is under control, they're back to work. Uh, they tell me the the sun is brighter, the sky is bluer, they they feel better. Um, and, and a lot of studies have looked at quality of life in people with atrial fibrillation. Um, and those studies have shown that people who have atrial fibrillation for sure have a lower quality of life than people without it. Now, now physicians, primary care physicians will watch this program. Okay, they don't like to admit it, but they, they do. No, I'm kidding. The, what do you want them to know about early detection? Well, I, I think I want them to know that if people are having intermittent symptoms, that they should order a, a heart monitor to, that will last at least a couple weeks to catch those symptoms. And then if they have atrial fibrillation, 
they may want to at least have one visit with an, elect with an electrophysiologist or a heart rhythm specialist just to make sure they're on the right treatment path. Everybody's treatment path is different. The right treatment path may be just controlling the heart rate. It may be trying to control the heart rhythm with antiarrhythmic medications. It may be an ablation. It may or may not require blood thinners depending on the other risk factors of, of the patient's profile for stroke. So I think that they should have one visit with a cardiologist, possibly an electrophysiologist, a heart rhythm doctor, to at least make sure they're on the right treatment path. And we're just about out of time. So what's new, by the way? I mean, what are some of the new treatment options on the horizon uh, with AFib? Yeah, I mean, AFib is a rapidly evolving and changing field, which is why I think seeing a specialist, as I mentioned, is important to the patient. There are newer antiarrhythmic medications for controlling the rhythm. There are newer blood thinners for preventing stroke. There are newer treatment options besides just catheter-based ablation procedure, which is where I spend a lot of my time. Um, there are newer surgical approaches to manage atrial fibrillation. Um, there are combined approaches, which I think have a lot of promise. Over at UCSD Medical Center and the new cardiovascular center we're building, we're going to have something that we call a hybrid OR, which is an operating room that has x-ray equipment and mapping equipment that, that we use for electrophysiology studies. And the surgeon and the electrophysiologist are going to work together to try to bring together what we both do best in terms of managing AFib. And I think that that has a great potential for people who have progressed and have more advanced disease. Well, how specifically, surgically, will you be working together? We were going the to be, surgeon and the cardiologist? We're going to be in the operating room at the same time, uh, the whole time. The surgeon can do things that I can't do. They can access the heart from the outside. They may be able to make thicker lesions. On the opposite side, we can do a lot of things that the, the surgeons can't. We can map and understand where the abnormal electrical signals are in the heart. The surgeons don't for the most part have the training to do that. There's areas from the heart that we can access from the inside that they can access from the outside. And so by doing the procedure at the same time, we can complement each other and ideally improve upon the results, especially for people who have more advanced disease. And the future of AFib then is like new centers, UCSD. Yeah. And when does it open, by the way? April, April of 2011, April? yeah. Okay, and uh, probably one of the most comprehensive centers here in uh, California? Yeah, we believe so. Yes, it's going to be a state-of-the-art facility um, with newer technologies like this hybrid room that will help us advance the care that we're delivering. Now, the, uh, do you think the future will be working together with the surgeons and wiping AFib out? I think for certain patients that's going to be the best option. Um, there's certainly patients, as we talked about, who by the time they see a heart rhythm specialist, the chances of my really having a significant impact in controlling their arrhythmia are, are pretty low. And I think in that, in those patients, I think a hybrid approach may, may well be a, an improvement. Okay, and as a recap here, because we talked yeah. on the phone, and you said, I said, what's your frustration? He goes, by the time they get to me, it's too late. Right. Their heart has already made changes that make it very tough Correct. for ablation to be a great option. Right. So how early should they see you? Well, I mean, I think that when they're diagnosed... I mean, when should they ask their doctor, I want to see a rhythm specialist? You know, I think when they're diagnosed with AFib, I think that they should see a cardiologist or ideally a heart rhythm specialist early on to sort of decide on the, on the appropriate and care. And that's not being done? No, I, not always. And, and I think it should be done early on. And I mean, I if think it's AFib, it's a rhythm problem, and they're yeah. not seeing the rhythm specialist? Correct. I, I, Is that right? What's going yeah. on? Well, I, I think it would be better to discuss all your options, and a rhythm specialist would be the best way to do that. Okay, so the patient, though, needs to yeah. take charge here. And, yes. uh, and, and and take it very seriously. For sure. Okay, because there is hope. Know all their options. Um, let's talk about medications for a moment. Yes. And uh, what, I mean, what are new medications that are uh, on the market? Like, for example, this genetarone. Tell yes. me your thoughts. Well, so the problem, Randy, with antiarrhythmics is they are notoriously difficult to use. Um, there are a lot of contraindications. There are a lot of potential toxicities. Antiarrhythmics are very commonly pro-arrhythmic, meaning they can cause other heart rhythm problems. Okay. When they're used to the wrong patients, they can even lead to irregular heart rhythms or sometimes sudden death in the right in the wrong setting. So, but in the right patient, in the right patient, they can be very effective. So, in the case of Maltac or Dronedrone, it has a very low risk of proarrhythmia. It's very unlikely to cause an abnormal heart rhythm that could be dangerous. So, that's a very nice thing because it's you use it's that easier. drug. I do. Yes. Okay. I do. The there's certain things you need to know about all medications. So for Maltac or Dronedrone, you don't want to use it in people who have advanced heart failure. You don't want to use it in people who have recently been hospitalized for heart failure. There's certain monitoring you may want to pre perform when the patients are started on a new medication, including monitoring their EKGs, possibly their liver function test. So you need to know how to use all the medications appropriately. Maltac is a new one for arrhythmia management. It has a lower what about quality toxicity of life? profile. For the right patient, what about quality yeah. of life? Well, I think for the right patient, people who are in normal rhythm have a better quality of life than people who are in AFib. And so 
Antiheretomix helped get you there. Um, some of the other newer things for atrial fibrillation, there are newer blood thinners that help prevent strokes. Uh, are one that was recently approved is called Pradax or the Bigotran. Uh, and that's a medication that has a very significant improvement over Coumadin or Warfarin, which has been the standard of preventing strokes for AFib for many, many years. Warfarin and Coumadin? Are the same medication, okay. yes, the generic okay. and the I got trade it. name, yes. So patients are on those. What yes. are you saying to them? Well, if you're on Coumadin and you've been on it for years and it's working fine, I think you should stay on Coumadin. I think for people who have difficult controlling their um, their Coumadin levels, Coumadin is a very difficult medication to use. The doses frequently need to be monitored and be adjusted. There are dietary restrictions. For people who have trouble keeping the Coumadin level in the therapeutic range, then the Bigotran, I will often switch them to that medication because it's more consistent in its profile in terms of the absorption. It doesn't require the monitoring that Coumadin does. And it has a benefit in terms of it actually lowers the risk of stroke, which is the main reason you're on the medication. It's more effective than Coumadin at lowering the risk of stroke. Good. And, 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 and again, if the patient's insurance covers this, yes. and if a patient's on Coumadin or on some of these other drugs, and they've been on the same drugs for years, yeah. and they haven't seen a rhythm specialist, you will look and evaluate their medications. Correct. Is that yeah, right? Exactly. So, you know, they, they may need to be on an alternative antirhythmic medication such as Maltac, Renetro, and Flecainide. There's a whole host of antirhythmic medications. A lot of ones that people use um, uh, in primary care often are um, amiodarone, which th people use it because it's less likely to be proarrhythmic. It has a, a lower initial side effect profile, but over time it can have a pretty substantial side effect profile, probably the biggest one of, of any medication that's currently FDA approved. So it's not always the best choice for people. And so unless you know what all of your options are, um, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. I guess this is a very big topic, disservice. obviously, yes. to, to narrow down. So where can people find out more? Okay, so somebody, they or a loved one have, have been diagnosed with AFib, yep. or they have a racing heart. The website at UCSD, the New Heart Center, they yeah. can go there? They can the information's go there. there? Yes, yes, there's information on our website for sure. Um, there are plenty of resources on, on, on the internet about um, atrial fibrillation and, and management. Um, you have to be a little cautious about what you read. Um, there's good websites and bad websites, but I think your, your primary source of information should be from your physician and at least in ideally a cardiologist, ideally a heart rhythm specialist. Um, and I want to thank you for coming to the show. Very interesting. But, but I think the main thing, at least I, I learned, and I think anybody watching this knows that if you are on medications and if you haven't talked to a rhythm specialist and if you are a candidate, or ablation therapy, then it's also a chance to maybe even get off some of the drugs. Yeah, in, in an ideal situation, not right. everybody. Yeah, right? well, the success rates I, I told you, Randy, are people who are off of antiarrhythmic medical therapy. Now, that's our goal. Our goal is to people to get off of these medications because a lot of them have side effects and a lot of people don't like to take them, um, and they're not always effective. So, uh, the, our main goal is to try to get the, the arrhythmia under control and get people off of medications. They're antiarrhythmics first. Often we can get people off of Coumadin or Warfarin if they have a low stroke risk profile as well. Um, I mean, if I had it, I'd want uh, ablation. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people I've feel that way. I've already self-diagnosed. A lot of people they feel do. that way for sure. Yeah. And you, you're one of them. By the I'm way. one of them. You're yes. one of them. Well, we have a lot of we have a lot of patients who are physicians, uh, especially at UCSD since we're a referral center for I mean, atrial people fibrillation. People travel from all over the country. I understand to come to, to go to your center. Yes, we, we do. A, we have a lot of experience with atrial fibrillation management at the university. Um, we've been one of the first centers in San Diego to do AFib ablations. We've been doing them for probably at least eight years now. Um, and we have one of the, the greater experiences in Southern California. What I like about you, because the fact that you're probably, I mean, you don't have financial considerations on what procedure you pick. Correct. Is that yes. correct? That's correct. I mean, yes. with you personally? No, I'm uh, an academic uh, cardiologist, so I'm. Uh, a professor with the University of California, so I don't have a lot of financial incentive to perform procedures, no. What are you excited most about as far as the future when it comes to AFib? Well, I mean, it's such a rapidly evolving field, Randy. I mean, every month almost, it seems like it changes. Uh, we were talking about before the show that the Heart Rhythm Society and American College of Cardiology po published an update recently on the management of atrial fibrillation. Less than a month after they published that update, they published another update. I mean, things are rapidly changing. For a catheter ablation ablation procedure, there's always new technologies um, that are coming out. It's always exciting to explore these new technologies and see if they could further advance the way we treat the arrhythmia. So it's always changing. What do you like most about what you do? Um, you know, what I do is a blend of everything. It's a blend of patient care, 
it's a blend of teach, teaching, and it's a blend of research to try to advance our current therapies. And so that role that I have with the university is always, always keeps the job fun and exciting. Now, I wanted to ask you this, and I know we're out of time, but are people getting this at like 40, 50, 60, 70? Yeah, and when so, does this seem to be coming on? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, AFib can affect people at any age range. The youngest patients I've taken care of that have done AFib ablations on, not any ablation, but AFib ablations on are in their early 20s. Um, I've actually done a lot of athletes um, locally really? who have AFib, and it affects their, their performance on the athletic field. How are they doing, by the way? They're doing quite well. They're, they're, okay. they're back on the field. So they're, they're out of AFib? Is that the and, and, term, out of AFib? Yeah, yeah. Okay. They don't have any more AFib, and they're out playing, playing sports great. and doing their things. Most commonly, though, AFib is a disease of, of older, older people. So I'd say the most common patient that I personally see with AFib is probably a patient who's about 60 years old, has high blood pressure, and the heart is going in and out of this heart rhythm problem. It becomes more and more prevalent as you get older, though. And AFib, a little bit of AFib turns into a lot of AFib. Quite commonly, And then yes. changes the structure of the heart. Correct. That's why you have to get in early, yes. right? Yes. Okay, good. I want to thank you for coming to the show. Yeah, thanks so much. Good, Appreciate your information. Time. Thank you so much. We'll thank have to you. have the rest of your group. Absolutely. Tell me about what's going on at the new center. Terrific. You've been watching the Wellness Hour, leader in medical news and information. I'm Randy Ivers. If you would like to see this interview again online, you go to our website at wellnesshour.com and just put in AFib. For now, I wish you good help. Thanks for watching The Wellness Hour, the leader in medical news with your host, Randy Alvarez, the authority on health issues.